about um, the role of academia in general and give a hint, special hint on capacity building in the global south. Yeah. Okay. 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 Since we have, I don't have um, any like a phone to monitor the time, so perhaps I should. I can give you my watch. Oh, can, I, can I borrow it? So we have until like 30 minutes, so I would say if you can stay in like be between 10 minutes maybe of the discussion. Okay. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, my name is Elena Pavan. I am a postdoc research fellow at the University of Trento here in Italy and a fellow of the Nexus Center. Um, this last session is uh, concluding uh, the morning uh, discussion with a take back on the role of academia. Uh, we will try to develop some more general uh, reflection on the role of academia with specific regard to research, education, and capacity building. Um, there has been a slight change of the schedule, so it's going to be just uh, the three of us on the stage for this panel, which will be shorter. Uh, we will talk for 30 minutes, more or less, uh, the three of us. And then we will open the floor for discussion on this panel and on the rest of the issue that we have discussed this morning. So uh, we imagine a very interactive discussion that will take actually place on the floor and not with this separation between the stage and the floor anymore. Um, we will conclude by 4.30, then coffee break, and then everybody is back at 5 for the keynote speech by Bruce Sterling. And so I was uh, asked to introduce this last session on the uh, role of academia, which is, um, I have a long love story with the internet governance, which just recently broke up, but just for practical reasons, uh, namely lack of funding. But um, when I was asked to moderate this panel and to reflect on the role of the academia, I, I thought it was a very hard task because it implied something like, a reflection on myself as an academic in the field of internet governance beside and beyond doing my job and achieving my professional goals like tenure, publication and things like that. And, and I reflected on the best way to introduce the speakers uh, from, from, from this panel. So um, we have on the one hand uh, Chinmay Arun, which is from India, and I'm going to read it because I don't want to <laughs> mistake. Uh, she is the research director of the Center for Communication Governan at Governance at the National Law University in Delhi. Uh, she's going to discuss the role of academia, um, in the, uh, especially in the capacity building uh, area and domain. And we have Juan Carlos de Martín, which is, uh, you know him, a co-director of the Nexus Center, who is going to discuss the role of the university in general and specifically within the internet governance field. Um, as for myself, I don't have uh, a lot to say, I have um, to admit, but when I started reflecting on, on, on what I think is, to, um, on how to introduce the whole discussion, I was thinking, what how I perceive the role of academia within the internet governance field. So I actually uh, brought like a, like a small input, a map, that uh, you can't really see the whole picture, but let's, uh, let's just say that 
this is it. Um, this is a network, an online network amongst websites that I draw when I was doing my PhD research, and this was uh, published in the book. Uh, that should I ring a bell like for self-advertisement of my book? But this is my book on internet governance and multi-stakeholderism, and it represents how the organizational websites in the internet governance domain link to each other. And when I was analyzing this network structure, which is a true network in the sense that it's really a network of website and links amongst website, I was, um, and every node is colored according to the domain. So if we assume that .edu is the domain that corresponds to academia and educational uh, institutions, what I found astonishing it was that there was just one small node up there, which is actually is the Berkman Center for Internet uh, and Society, up there, and that was the only organizational presence of the academia in the whole internet governance domain. And I thought, on the other hand, we are so many academics discussing in this, like in places like the Internet Governance Forum. So, if we're not acting on on behalf of our organization, but as individual, what is our role? And I came up with like a threefold idea. On the one hand, I thought about ourselves, because uh, we belong to this group, as active contributors to the internet governance domain. Because with our expertise, we actually play a role in developing what we call this umbrella term that we call internet governance. And on the other hand, we're also watchdogs in the sense that we look at the progresses of the processes and how issues develop. And at some point, we have to stand up and say whether the process is doing something right or if something bad is going to happen. But then I thought that we also have a very hard task, which is working as mediators. And working as mediators not only between the different stakeholders, because academia per se, to me at least, is not a stakeholder in the governance process, but is the actor that mediates between different agendas and perspectives. But we also have a further burden, which is to translate um, the technicality of the internet governance into social discourse. We have to transform it into a public opinion issue. And so I thought that perhaps stimulating the discussion with this in mind would help our speakers and everybody in the floor uh, reflecting about what we are actually doing within the internet governance field as individuals. In, somehow in between, in between two roles, on the one hand the professional one and on the other a little bit of some kind of activist, because all of us are here in the internet governance field, because we feel that internet should be something. It should be developed according to a certain path. So, this said, I would invite Chin Mai uh, to discuss, uh, as I said before, the role of academia for capacity building in the global south. Thank you, Elena. Um, so, in this, um, extremely easy post-lunch session in which everyone's all awake. Um, I'm, I'm going to do my best to, um, to explain why we chose to do what we do and the steps that we are taking towards capacity building simply because, um, as one academic told me, he said it's very dangerous to speak on behalf of all academics. There will always be someone in the room that says, yeah, I don't agree. Um, so we, when we began the Center for Communication Governance, um, I was actually in a position in which I had to make a choice um, to join a very reputed uh, civil society organization, which I do work with and which supports our work, or whether to stay in academia and to go to all the effort of setting up this new research center. And um, the reason that I chose to do it, I hope, will become apparent as I go through this narrative. It was because I really felt that academia has a special role to play that civil society cannot play for it. And so I felt that it was important to create this institution in India and to, you know, at least to compel it to begin playing that role a little bit. Um, so I'm going to begin with where Bill left off, uh, where he very correctly pointed out that the World Conference on International Telecommunications was um, an illustration in how uh, the lack of capacity in the global south can lead to fairly disastrous consequences in terms of um, how, 
how countries and individuals within countries form their positions uh, when all they have to judge uh, which side they're going to take is basically you know, material that's being thrown at them from particular perspectives. And when they have no tools to really judge this material for themselves. Um, so I'll begin with the wicket and my little brush with it. Um, I, was, I was there and I was a part of the Indian delegation. I engaged with Indian civil society uh, before I went there. And then I'm going to move on to how the Center for Communication Governance is it's trying to do its little bit to engage with this whole capacity building problem. Um, and then I'm going to invite feedback um, from all of you in terms of what you think we could be doing better, bearing in mind that we have limited funding and limited resources, of course, but also what are the synergies with other efforts that we could draw upon and um, you know, how, how we could basically do our job better. So with the wicket, it, it began this way that I just moved to Delhi and we hadn't even set up CCG. And a group of civil society people said that, okay, we're drafting a response to the wicket. We're going to comment on the international telecommunication regulations. Come along. Um, and I said, look, this is ridiculous because, you know, the wicket's in a few weeks. And I haven't studied the subject at all. I haven't read one book on it or a single paper. And I really, I don't feel like I'm equipped to be a part of this conversation. Uh, but they dragged me along anyway, and um, I was a part of this meeting, and by the end, I was horrified at, at the um, complete lack of capacity in processing this material in the room. See, the, um, the thing that is supposedly useful about me, I'm not sure that everyone would agree, is that I am a lawyer. And um, there were multiple civil society people in the room, but there were only two lawyers, and we were the only two people that were able to read these treaties. And, um, remind everyone of the little little technicalities like the ITRs are subordinate to the ITU constitution, so you can't change a definition in the ITRs if, if there's a definition in the constitution that remains static because the constitution dominates. Now, this is, this is very simple, but guess what? The Indian delegation, the government delegation got this wrong. Civil society inputs thanks to us pointed out that this is a legal technicality, you can't ask for a change that, that you know, law doesn't permit. Uh, but the Indian delegation went ahead and did it anyway, and uh, very embarrassingly for all of us, had to be corrected by the US government at the wicket about this technicality. Um, and so, amazingly enough, I realized that sometimes the problem can be that there are no lawyers in the room. Uh, but then, additionally, the problem was also that, um, that nobody had access to basic resources. So, like a, a proper nerd, my first reaction was, okay, I need books on the ITU, I need to understand this. And so um, I looked up you know, which, what kind of material we needed to have. It wasn't in our library. It wasn't in any of the other significant libraries in Delhi. And Delhi's got among the best libraries in India, mostly. Um, so I called up the industry chambers. I called up at and I said, you know, I, just, I need to read these books. I'll come to your office if you have them. But nobody had the books. Um, and so the basic material was not available in India. And we just had to cobble together what was, whatever was available online and work with it. Um, when the delegation actually reached the wicket, we had multiple people at the table. You know, there was civil society, there were people from the government of India, and then there were industry people. And we noticed that the trouble with the government was that although they were trying really hard, they just had a few people at the table, none of them lawyers, none of them with access to legal expertise because the process of acquiring it is tedious for them. Civil society, similarly, depending on the NGOs, some of them had lawyers there, but some of them didn't. And the ones that didn't actually just had to believe some of the things that were being told. What is the status of a preamble? Um, what is the status of a notification in this particular area? Um, and the people from the companies, that was interesting because they were actually quite well informed. Uh, they were mostly representatives of global companies. And the parent company, which was usually based in the US, had a great legal team. So they were the people that had the red lines and had memos on all of the material. But uh, their brief also came from the parent company. So it's not as if the India office of, uh, of Facebook is going to be saying something different from the US office of Facebook. So that was, that was their limitation. Um, and so we realized that, um, that firstly, we need knowledge generation on just deconstructing these debates. That secondly, we need not only to provide um, that um, irritating but necessary um, 
element of lawyers to each delegation, but also to make sure that the lawyers are reasonably well educated and that they understand the function of you know, architecture or multi-stakeholderism in this space because sometimes lawyers can be quite linear in the way in which they think about these things and we all know that that doesn't work so well for the internet. Um, we also decided at CCG, moving on to the ways in which we decided um, to handle this, that lawyers are also an easier group for us particularly to handle because ours is a research center based in a law school. The better Indian law schools are all small and very closely connected, which means that actually we had access to the lawyers that worked for the multinational companies, to most of the lawyers that worked for the civil society organizations, and now uh, that the government has finally hired itself a couple of lawyers, to them as well. Um, but before that, so before the government hired its lawyers, we were actually in a place in which whenever the government was on a committee and they were asked a series of questions, we at CCG ended up being the people that were able to give them the most comprehensive comments because we had access to larger research teams thanks to our students and we had access to databases which nobody else had access to, with, you know, thanks to resources. Um, so we figured that maybe one way to do this is just to take this tiny target group of lawyers and make sure that we introduce internet governance into their education, both formally, but also sort of um, in ways in which they can, students that are interested in the subject but aren't directly accessible to us because you know they're in a different location geographically or we just don't know about them, that they should be able to find our material and educate themselves. Because the other thing that I noticed every time I have been to a conference or to a lecture, uh, the students love internet governance. I don't, you know, I don't have to do a thing, I don't have to work as a teacher, it's just, they, it just, it comes so naturally to them and it's so interesting to them that they run to me themselves and they ask me for material and they ask me for my course outline. So I was thinking that there's this whole demographic to whom you can make this material available and they will actually self-learn. There will be lawyers who are outside of the little world in which we live and if this material is accessible to them, they will be able to self-learn and they will be able to get in touch with us um, if they need to. And then finally we thought that for, um, for people that are not lawyers, that are journalists, that are civil society people, we also need to help them by breaking down this material so that they're able to negotiate it. Um, and then to form their own opinions, but based on an actual reading of the different issues involved, the implications of reading a document a particular way versus another way, and based on a slightly intelligent understanding of the different um, perspectives that are available on an issue. So I'm just going to show you the two prototypes that we built. Uh, this is in addition to the usual work that we do, which is of course we have fellows who write research papers and you know, try to generate basic material on these issues. Um, and we, we run our own internet governance courses and all of that, but in addition, Sorry, let me just find this. We've just built this new resource. Um, we call it CCGTLR. Um, and so this is basically, it's completely open access and we've had it announced on all the legal news websites. We're going to write to law schools and make sure that they sort of uh, send this down the ladder to faculty. And so interestingly, the part of CCGTLR that receives the most hits already, although it's really underdeveloped and we're still working on it, is the part that deals with the internet, and that looks something like this. Um, so there's a dynamic index, we're still populating it, and the idea is that people look at the index on the right, find the material that they need, you know, go to it and use it, and we've got a feedback link that permits them to send us material that isn't on there, but they feel like it should be. We've also got a collection of over 40 videos which we need to add to CCGTLR, and that's for people that feel like they need to be taught a little more than, um, and for whom, you know, sort of reading and self-learning doesn't work. So this is kind of our way of reaching both law students and teachers in other law schools to encourage them to easily introduce subjects like internet governance and media regulation into their curriculum. And then we've got, this other tool that we, this is very new, it's a MacArthur funded project. And so what we're doing with this is that every time there is a, a global conference of significance to India, we try as far as possible to go, but even if we're not able to go to, uh, to monitor it remotely. And then we do a report that basically crystallizes the key issues um, like that. Sorry. Um, and then sort of, 
explains the issue briefly with background, with where you can find primary material, with the key global positions on the subject, the positions that, um, that prominent representatives from India are taking, and the reasons for their positions. And we're keeping both CCGTLR and this completely nonpartisan. There are no opinions offered, even when they are subjects on which we have a strong opinion. We don't express it in these documents because we want it to be something that people feel very comfortable using. In addition to this, we're also moving towards doing briefings, and I anticipate that it'll take us at least a year before we get successful with this. So our plan is that before an event takes place, we will uh, we'll hold a public briefing in Delhi in which we highlight the key issues, we pull out you know, all of our research and our material on it, and again, the key positions, and we explain to people exactly what's going down, we break it down, we give them a chance to ask us questions. And um, we're hoping that what will come of this is that the people who participate in these debates and the people who write about them basically end up being better informed about what's going on there. So winding up, um, I just, I mean, I think that my experience with engaging in these spaces has been that I have been frankly horrified at the level of participation from the global south, uh, both in terms of numbers and in terms of the access to material. And I understand that a part of it is just the manner in which our education system is dealing with these issues. So if you look at countries like uh, Myanmar, Bhutan, Bangladesh, or Sri Lanka, you're not really going to see a lot of strong participation from these countries at, you know, at say, Net Mundial or, or at any other conference of significance to them. And yet, if there should ever be a global decision on these issues, it will affect people in these countries. Um, what we are trying to do, unfortunately, only works for India right now, partly because of funding constraints and partly because we would actually need to involve academics from these other countries to start building up resources that address their needs. But where we were coming from was basically that um, it is what Bill said before also, that each of these countries, um, if you understand it as an ecosystem, now uh, the country that you belong to is going to influence somewhat your priorities within that ecosystem. Except that if you don't understand how the space works and you don't understand what your own interests are vis-a-vis -vis the space, you're going to find it very difficult to take any kind of useful position in the space. And, in that sense, I feel like although external efforts to help, um, help with capacity building and knowledge generation in the Global South do help in some measure, it's critical that the Global South and each country in the Global South develops its own resources that sort of engage with its own internal priorities and its own place within the ecosystem and are also sort of more legitimate from the perspective of the ecosystem. Um, this is something that it, it isn't really, um, it isn't new, it isn't something that can be said only in the context of the ITU. People say this even of, of the WTO that if countries are to negotiate in any useful manner, they, they need the capacity to do so. And um, if they are to decide which positions they want to align with, they need to be able to identify the political and economic interests that kind of sweep through their own civil society and their academia. And while these interests may sometimes be aligned with human rights priorities and other priorities, it is important that everyone is able to see them quite clearly and then to make their own decisions about whether to work with them or not. Yeah, so um, I feel like academia with our privileged access to libraries and to our, our databases, our external networks, and to the fact that we're usually not tethered by profit motives or too close a connection with government, it means that we're uniquely placed really to build both the material and to help people sort through what they want in as neutral a manner as possible. Thank you, Chinmay. Um, I pass now the word to Juan Carlos. Thank you. Now, the role of academia in internet governance, uh, it's, um, I will try to briefly address the two parts of the sentence, the role of academia in general, and then specifically, what is specifically challenging or interesting regarding the role of academia in internet governance or internet issues at large. Now, the first step, the role of uh, academia, the role of university 
uh, in society is much uh, more contested issue than we typically assume, at least in this crowd, in this group of people, in this network of centers, in the sense that you find the whole range of positions saying that academics should only stick to their scientific activities and do not be interested in current events in policy making and so on. That's an extreme position, which is often captured by the idea of the ivory tower. The ivory tower, this metaphor, which never actually existed in practice, but means uh, this, this completely autonomous entity which science uh, should only think about their own uh, objective and mission which is to increase knowledge and have nothing to do with the rest of society. And the other extreme of this position is actually, the, which is the classic old Marxist position, is that actually we have no autonomy, we are completely determined by essentially economic uh, power, therefore our freedom is uh, completely an illusion. Uh, within this, these two extremes actually is uh, what uh, actually is going on, which means that uh, we have uh, some degree of autonomy, it's not complete and it shouldn't be complete, in the sense that uh, we want to, we have a dialogue even if it's implicit with society, and we have a responsibility for what we do. The Avery Tower position had the implicit assumption that we were not responsible for the knowledge production we were doing, uh, on the contrary, we have a responsibility exactly like any other human activity. We have a responsibility also for our scientific activities. So we do have an interaction with society at large. And uh, in the end, uh, how much we want to be close to one extreme or in completely influ influenced, which is the other extreme, is pretty much an institutional and individual decision. So how much you want to be explicitly sensitive to the dialogue with different actors in society, how much you want to be explicitly uh, interested in current events, how much you want to deal with decision making. It's a decision and like all decisions are driven by different factors, can be individual factors, uh, your character, your view of yourself in the world, uh, incentives, disincentives. Uh, in the network of centers, and certainly for the Nexus Center, we had made a very clear decision from the beginning, which is we are a research center, but it's a research center which is sensitive to the policy making sphere, and uh, we are aware that there has to be a boundary, but we, are, we were ready to experiment with that boundary and try to, to do that and uh, we're interested in current events, uh, and therefore we also take the responsibility of potentially shaping current events, because you could be interested in a current event, you produce some research and some data, and that data and that research, if it's timely and relevant, it could affect the, the, the events itself that you studied. So we were ready to take that risk, but it was our individual and institutional decision to do so. And uh, knowing quite well that uh, going from uh, leaving, well, extending this purely scientific disciplinary activity towards the direction of policy recommendation, it's a hard job, which typically we are not trained to do, but it can be fun, it can be challenging. That's what we thought and what we think. And also it's a job that academically is not rewarded at least, in the least, actually it's, there is a clear disincentive in doing so. But we and other people, many in this room, decided to do any way to try. But I want to, what I want to stress is that is in a broad spectrum of behaviors, it's a choice whether to feel that as an academic, as a university professor or a researcher, you want to be more involved, you want to speak with different actors, and you want to try your hand at doing something which is close to science, but it's not science, which is policy recommendation in the proper way. So having said that in general, then what about the internet? Now the internet, I think, presents specific challenges for a number of reasons. First of all, the internet by historical uh, point of view is, is a very recent event and typically uh, academia is not extremely fast at addressing uh, events, particularly for teaching. In the US, in the Anglo-Saxon world is different, but for instance in Italy to start uh, a course uh, on something that is still fresh and recent, it takes a long time. So our reaction time, institutional reaction time, to something as new as the internet, even though now it's not that new, but still it's fairly new by historical standard, it's low. Uh, then at least certain parts of the internet are very rapidly changing. 
think about the debate on internet governance at the incredible acceleration of the, of the recent months, and again, the timing and the pace of academia is not uh, the same. So it presents a specific challenge. You want to address something that is changing as you try to study it. On the other hand, if you manage to keep the pace, you also have an opportunity potentially to shape the course of events, perhaps. And also, another specific challenge of the internet is that in many cases, including internet governance, what you need is interdisciplinary research, which is something that is often uh, uploaded and uh, recommended, but uh, it's difficult to do proper interdisciplinary research. It's difficult. And secondly, at least in certain systems, and certainly the Italian system, there is a clear disincentive again in doing interdisciplinary research. In recent years, we've become even more disciplinary than we were in the past. So you can see if in general you can have a choice, broadly speaking, in trying to, in trying to decide, at least as an individual, what kind of academic, what kind of professor, what kind of researcher you are in relationship to society, and you have to develop a pretty articulated sets of deontological guidelines in doing so. Uh, if you want to do that, be in specifically involved and address internet issues, you have this other set of potential uh, obstacles to overcome. Having said that, I, and that's the reason why I'm on this stage, of course, and I give my hand in also in organizing the event, I do think, even though it's difficult, so assuming we want to deal we want to have a more active, more proactive role with society, and assuming we want to deal with the internet issues, I think it's very important as academics that we do it. Why? For several reasons. The first, first one is that uh, the internet now is, a, uh, is already clear, and it will be even more clear in the, in the coming years, is that has enormous social importance, meaning economic importance, political importance, cultural importance, so it's, one of the, it's not the issue because there are many other important uh, and fundamental issues in front of us uh, in the next 20 years, but it's definitely one of the issues. And so can, can we as academics uh, say, well, that's, you know, it's complicated, uh, it's too fastly evolving, it's too difficult, no, I'm not interested? Perhaps uh, you can say that, but my point of view is that we cannot uh, let this fundamental issue go without uh, academia playing a role. Secondly, it's very contingent. We are, we are, I believe, but I look forward to hearing what you, what you think during the question and answer session that will follow shortly after this panel. I believe that we are in, in a still fluid situation. We are not starting from scratch. Already there are path dependencies and huge institutions already working, but we are still in a fairly fluid phase regarding several aspects of the internet. And so, the time, the opportunity to have an impact as researchers is now. Five years from now could be too late. And uh, there are historical precedents. And uh, for instance, uh, I always find fascinating the parallels between uh, the, the time we're living now and the early 20s when the radio was being defined. Uh, if you read some of the discussions in the US uh, when the, the Radio Act of 1927 was being discussed, it's surprising how similar it sounds to the discussion about the internet. It was very clear to the, to the Congress uh, in the US that uh, the regulation of radio, the creation of the Federal Communications Commission was going to have an impact, not only an economic impact, but also an impact on democracy. It's very plain in their discussions, and it's true. We are still dealing with the Federal Communications Commission, and we are still dealing with the framework created in 1927 in the US, and with many differences in other countries. So I think we are still in a pre-27 situation, where the situation is still somewhat fluid, so now is the time to do, have an impact. And finally, uh, the internet is ours. In what sense? Well, of course, the internet now belongs to three billion people, and soon it will belong to the whole almost all the citizens of the world, but the internet was, is a brainchild of academia. It was conceived by researchers. It was shaped by the research ethos of academics. We were involved for decades, in the, not only in the running from the technical point of view, but in the shaping of the institution. And many of the organizations that are currently running the internet, at least parts of the internet, have still these connections with the university world. As Stefano Quintarelli said uh, this morning, 
uh, the ethos of academia meant that if you wanted to start something email, it was obvious that it was going to be distributed and not a central platform, email.com. Because that was the ethos of academia in the 70s and forward. Uh, so what happened? It looks like that at least part of academia thought, well, now the internet is mature, is up to for commercial exploitation, and we don't have to play a role anymore. We have our own business to run. And, uh, and that's probably was wrong or is wrong. We have an opportunity to remind that uh, the internet is it, what it is precisely because it was shaped by an academic ethos. And that ethos is what made the internet different from other communications network. So that's a, yet another reason why academia, uh, university professors, researchers, uh, uh, and others in our world uh, have a, uh, should have a motivation to be involved in this uh, internet governance and more broadly in internet issues studies. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to thank both uh, our speakers because in a very um, surprising way we did discuss a little bit the inputs that we were going to give during the panel but not the specific contents and I found that there was like a, a, a an only line, a, a unique line of thought that was joining together our three um, inputs like and especially um, theirs. Um, I don't know how to proceed now because I, I would really like to uh, leave the floor for the question and answer. I just maybe conclude saying what to me are the keywords that emerge from um, the inputs provided by our speakers. So the first one is um, definite responsibility because as academics we act with a high responsibility of taking part of of the internet governance and in deploying the internet governance. The second um, word that I th thought of is legitimization. What legitimize us as academic to actually become active part and contributors and watchdog uh, inside the process of internet governance. And the third is implementation. Because what we do most of the time is being academics also when we participate within global forums or when we do this capacity building programs. But then, so we help elaborating plans. But then somehow we're still a step behind participating to the full implementation of the very good things that we suggest all the time. And so on this three keywords, I really leave the floor open for discussion on what has been said now on the stage and on all the issues that we have discussed this morning. So feel free to participate, but we will move this downstairs, right? Okay. First of all, thank you, Elena, for moderating this session. And now, actually, what we're going to do is uh, to step down from this very hierarchical structured uh, space. And together with my good friend uh, Urs Gasser, we're going to come down right there and try to have a very open form of free session regarding what we discussed during the whole day. It's a wonderful opportunity to listen to your voice uh, and not only two hours. Let me go down. All right, so thank you very much. While you're walking down, um, Juan Carlos, I have a question for you to kick uh, things off. And that is, I think in both presentations, uh, we've heard the role of time, the essence of time, right? Jin Maie was describing the situation where she had to catch up uh, in a very short period of time uh, to participate in, a, in an important policy event. And you, Juan Carlos, you also pointed out um, the challenge, of course, that we have to synchronize um, uh, the fast-paced environment in which we live, where decisions are made by big companies, of course, overnight. That may be game changers by policy makers um, who travel around the world, it seems. We've seen it this morning uh, on this chart. Um, uh, and we as academics, yeah, should, should somehow find the time to uh, reflect, do research, be thoughtful, translate the research, make it accessible and the like. Uh, all real time uh, in order to be effective. And so I was wondering, um, whether you can expand a bit on this question on, and Jin Mai as well of, of time 
and how we as academics um, deal with, with this challenge. And as to what extent, that's a thing you, you didn't mention, the internet, who's not only been invented by academics, and not only academics shaping the internet, but of course the internet changing how we as academic, academics work and may participate. So in other words, does the internet help us with the timing issue or is it just accelerating the whole thing and we're totally lost? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, um, both, I guess. Being in the po policy space, of course, means a lot more knee-jerk responses than one is always comfortable with as an academic, and that's something that I struggle with really often. Um, but also, I have to say that once when I was asked for government inputs um, over a long series of subjects, I needed to recruit three former students to help me with the research since they were the ones that had done internet governance with me. And so the team that worked on this was actually spread across three cities and we worked together using the internet. And this involved discussion and actual research, so I think that it's had its very substantial benefits. And the other part is something that I guess that we'd have to work out for ourselves, how, how far we want to be knee-jerk and, um, and kind of allow time to shackle what we will do um, versus how far we say that, sorry, we're not policy people, we're academics. Thank you. Juan Carlos, you want to add to that? Just very quickly the, on the fact that the, uh, the real prerequisite in order to address this fast-changing space is actually to have a, a substantial degree of autonomy. Autonomy means uh, uh, you're free to use your time and your resources uh, quite freely. And uh, so it becomes pretty much an institutional issue, meaning how free are you, are you to set your agenda, are free to change your, your commitments. Uh, and uh, in this space, we really go into the discussion about the university in the sense that I have tenure and uh, I'm using that also to do some of the stuff we're doing because I can, and actually I think one, one of the historical reasons, especially in the US for tenure was precisely that, to free you in order to be able to address also controversial, complicated issues in, also in a timely manner. And, and resources is obvious, is also another prerequisite. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Where, where is Malavika? She's not here. She left, okay. Um, so Jeff, you're, you're prepared for a cold call. So you're, you're, you recently you know, um, uh, wrote the PhD thesis. And, and so listening to this conversation about um, uh, the challenges we have on the one hand side as academics, especially as young academics, right? Uh, yes, you have to write your dissertation, you have to worry about jobs and trajectories and the like. But at the same time, as we also heard um, uh, during the panel, internet governance in particular, you're focusing on other things or specific issues, I should say, such as um, privacy as one governance issue. Um, these are exciting topics, especially for young people. You've also mentioned it, Jin Mai, that students love to work on internet governance stuff. So how, how, what are your experiences like navigating the space, your personal interests, uh, becoming an academic, contributing to all these uh, complex debates, but at the same time also having to, of course, navigate um, uh, the field and, and get a degree and, and be a lawyer and, you know, at the same time working interdisciplinary. Can you share a, a few thoughts and general reflections on, on what, you've, what you've heard? Uh, that's a very tough question. Um, I think for me personally the, the main issue is to, to be able to focus because in this space there's so many interesting stuff going on. And uh, especially in the internal governance uh, debate, it's so broad and it covers, it's sort of a horizontal uh, discussion. Uh, and um, I think the, the added value of academics is to, 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 to provide in-depth research in specific topics. Uh, and, 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 and personally, my career, very early career, uh, I'm struggling to really focus uh, to find, to find focus in, in, in this space. And just a follow-up question, is there anything that, 
we're a network of centers, right? We have many leaders here from, net, uh, from centers. Is there anything that centers can do for young researchers to open up spaces so that it makes your life easier to focus? Or we have some echo somewhere, yeah. You have to think about that. Anyone else? Yeah, from HIG, yes, coming. I have slippery shoes, so I have to be careful. Thank you. Um, I'm Osvaldo Saldias from the HIG, the Humboldt Institute in Berlin. If I may, I would like to step back from the actorness dimension that the ah, conversation like is, that. Yeah, and get go to the um, epistemic dimension of uh, the academic role in uh, being coming myself from the field of uh, comparative law and politics. Um, I was wondering and thinking during the first and the second panel from this design top down and bottom up that especially in the second panel top uh, bottom up that the cultural and the contextual um, dimension and factor was uh, mentioned and addressed by Wolfgang, by Daniel. Context is important. So I was thinking and putting myself in the position of those who will be drafting the synthesis as we, of these case studies. Um, how do we deal in our commitment to theory building? Because that's what the glue that binds us together as an epistemic community, knowledge creation. When we um, are in, in the task of uh, making a synthesis of the case studies that are culturally so different, how are we going to deal with context and culture? And my two options, alternatives are when we are learning about India, the Enquete Commission, Israel, one, one possibility is we ask the experts to reflect on the cultural dimension within their research, like Jeanette Hoffman did, explaining what the Enquete Commission does, or, uh, or we abstract of the cultural differences in internet process, internet governance processes, in order to reduce complexity of this phenomena. And when the, those who are making the synthesis, they just distill, how you say, they distill the lessons without respect to context, this would be easier. But the problem is, who is going to address the contextual factors? Are these people who are going to reflect upon differences, are these going to be people, scholars, committed to, with comparison, with cultures? Because we are not doing it. So I would want to provoke a little bit and claim for the introduction of a new, of an expanded disciplinary epistemic function, which is the comparative internet scholar. Um, this is provocative. How are we going to deal with the differences? Um, this is a question to those who are going to draft the synthesis. I have no clue. Thank you, that's a great provocation. Uh, I would be happy to comment on, on the case studies and how we plan to do the synthesis. But I think you're asking a broader question and I would like to stay in the broader theme for, for the time being um, because we're still kind of um, uh, reflecting on, on the last panel uh, before we then can totally open up and talk about uh, anything that comes to mind. Um, but I want to actually bring in Rob uh, uh, and have your reflections as the research director of the Berkman Center, someone who has done extensive comparative work um, uh, and thinking a lot about these methodological issues. How do we do that? Yeah, not in the context of the case studies here necessarily, but in general, is there uh, this comparatist internet legal studies or internet studies scholar emerging, or are we just at the beginning of that? What are your thoughts? Uh, thank you for the out, so I can say yes, we're at the beginning of it. <laughs> it would be the starting point. I, I think in general, comparative work is very, very difficult. Um, I, I started out my career as an anthropologist where every detail was essential and you couldn't tell the story unless you told the whole story. Um, I then switched to the other side of the pendulum and spent time as an economist where 
we tried to reduce the world into that one variable that was really we wanted to understand this one thing. And I think we're trying to span somewhere between those two areas. And in almost every respect, when we're studying these very, very complex um, situations across different countries, we have many, many more variables than we have observations. And I think that weds us, I think, in the short term to really focus on case studies and understanding what we know about a given context at a given time. And then, of course, the, the great challenge there is trying to excerpt from there to extrapolate from that into, into wider, more comparative things. And I think that's the right direction that we're going, and uh, it's great to see that. I think we are at the beginning, as you, as you say. Thank you. And just as a footnote, one way to think about it is what you extract from the case studies uh, can be seen as working hypotheses or can be seen as uh, initial observations that, that can be improved or validated over time. So I think we also have to move away from there is this one publication that forever will tell the truth about X or Y. No, this is a learning process. Uh, and, and we also have to create, I think, new ways to present our, our research, to put it back into context and, and also use technology to update and, and add and expand uh, on our findings as we know better, maybe in a month or a year from now, and hopefully we know better, yeah. Over to you, Juan Carlos. Actually, there was, do you want to, to intervene? Yes, I, um, I'm Paul Fenninger from the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, and um, I wanted to, to, to add something or stress one dimension that I did not hear sufficiently um, being stressed during the panel discussions on the role of academia in the internet governance ecosystem, which is the role of academia in evidence-based policy processes. This is something that we are trying to do in the internet and jurisdiction process, that we integrate through the internet and jurisdiction observatory experts from around the world, basically, to inform the participants of the ongoing policy process about emerging trends, about high-level patterns. And I think this role of academia it's not only limited to the mapping on a meta level, which is very relevant, and the transfer of knowledge, um, education being a neutral venue for deliberation, all of these things are incredibly valuable and, and important. But I think um, there's an active role for academia to play in, in, in the creation of distributed governance systems, which is providing the basis for having an evidence-based um, um, deliberation and policy process, and therefore enable better policies and, and uh, innovation in this um, space. Thank you. And the Internet and Jurisdiction Project clearly um, creates a template and thinks also strategically about how to collect that data that then can um, serve as an evidence base uh, for policy making. So this is a great case study in, in, uh, in that respect. If you're not familiar with the project, I encourage you uh, to check it out. Bill, you had a response to, to that evidence-based policy making or a separate threat. Anyone who'd like to follow up on the evidence-based policy making? Stefan, you would like to comment on this particular one? I thought so. I read your mind, you know. I see you typing and I know there is something on your mind. No, I think it's. Uh, I think a, a critical element is going to be exactly to, uh, um, um, to, f from an academic point of view, to f to start finding out what works under what conditions and for what purposes, uh, which could be anyway what you call evidence-based uh, 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 policy making, uh, and I think uh, um, what a, t a kind. So we had different meaning. Of course, academia has many methodologies. We had comparative methodologies, we have different kinds of methodologies, but one kind of methodology that we have to start applying more and more in order to get to the evidence is really uh, so-called action research or experimental kind of research is that you actually, anyway, go, go in, do stuff, learn and do and learn and do. And, and that kind of uh, more action research kind of focus uh, is really what, what is needed in this space, which ha till date has been less prominent because till date most of the academics that are working on internet governance uh, are coming from the policy and legal uh, 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 perspective quite often uh, um, or I mean, because it's governance uh, uh, and so that automatically means that the methodologies uh, are quite often anyway limited to, to, the, to the discipline uh, 
uh, that the, uh, uh, um, the legal scholarship uh, uh, brings to bear, which, by the way, can be varied, meaning having been <laughs> a fellow in social legal studies, uh, know that there are a variety of methodologies there as well. But I think experimental research is, uh, is highly needed to bring the evidence that, uh, that uh, uh, we have here. If I can make a, a quick um, comment, uh, of course, uh, as a researcher, I cannot be, have anything but good words for evidence-based uh, and data collection and so on, because that's what we do uh, for, for our profession does. But at the same time, there is a, such a strong evidence, uh, actually maybe across history, but also in recent years, that very clear academic evidence is systematically and continuously ignored at the policy level decision, uh, which means that we have to be realistic uh, about the, the power of evidence-based uh, policy making. And I think the, the antidote to that is to a connection to the level of rights. So as I mentioned this morning, we are discussing internal governance, and at the same time there is a broader and broader movement talking about digital rights, which is not based on evidence, it's not scientifically proved, it's normative and argumentative, but it's a, a powerful potential corrective of the simply power dynamics uh, that are happening at the political level, ignoring the evidence base whenever they think it's convenient to be ignored. Wolfgang, do you have a direct follow-up or is it a new threat? Um, All right, then turn over to you. Okay. Um, well, uh, Lorenzo Pupil, um, today I spoke as a telecomitat, now I spoke as a member of GIGANET because I'm, I have two ads. Um, I think that uh, what is uh, my, the feeling I'm getting from this discussion is that uh, we can sum up saying that to some extent also what uh, Stefano said this morning, looks like uh, the internet, there was like an internet of the golden age that was very good because it was the, the internet of the 90s, because it was uh, basically done by the academics now, instead, uh, because there are less academics working on the internet, uh, internet is something uh, not wrong, but definitely different from the past. Um, I think that uh, definitely the internet of the past was, uh, was uh, heavily created by academics, and for this reason, had also some problems, like, uh, for instance, didn't have uh, built-in security because there was no need, because it was a close community, or just a few thousand, a uh, few hundred thousand maybe users. Now, internet is a totally different uh, thing. It's much more uh, uh, um, dynamic and heterogeneous because it's serving three billion uh, uh, customers, all totally different applications, totally different services. Therefore, I think that the Today, uh, the academy has an incredible role to try to understand how, how uh, the challenge coming out from today's internet is completely different from the past should be approached. So I think we should not look with nostalgia to the past, but uh, looking forward to the uh, much broader uh, issue that you have. For instance, 